we're talking about the Bible, so I need you to open a Bible. You can have, may have your electronic copy. You can use a pew Bible. I hope you have your own copy of God's Word that you carry with you. But uh, we're going to look at Nehemiah, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, tucked away in there, and uh, there is all kinds of gold in the little book of Nehemiah. And uh, for reasons that will become obvious, if not already, I want to invite you to stand as we read God's Word. Nehemiah chapter 8 begins this way. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people gathered together at the square in front of the water gate. Uh, this is in uh, Jerusalem. They asked the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had given Israel. On the first day of the seventh month, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly of men and women, all who could listen with understanding. While he was facing the square in front of the water gate, he read out of it from daybreak until noon before the men, the women, those who could understand. All the people listened attentively to the book of the law. The scribe Ezra stood on a high platform made for this purpose. Mattathiah, Shema, Anani, Uriah, Hilkiah, Maaseiah stood beside him on his right to his left. Pediah, Meshiel, Malchiah, Hashem, Hashbadanah, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Ezra opened the book in full view of all the people since he was elevated above everyone. As he opened it, all the people stood up. Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and with their hands uplifted, all the people said, Amen, Amen. Then, they knelt low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Yeshua, Benai, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maaseiah, Kelete, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peliah, who were Levites, explained the law to the people as they stood in their places. They read out of the book of the law of God, translating and giving meaning so that the people could understand what was read. Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest and scribe, the Levites who were instructing the people said to all of them, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep for all the people were weeping as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go and eat what is rich, drink what is sweet, send portions to those who have nothing prepared, since today is holy to our Lord. Don't grieve, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites quieted all the people, saying, be still, since today is holy. Don't grieve. Then all the people began to eat and drink, because they had understood the words that were explained to them. God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. So this is Nehemiah. Nehemiah, he was at a big, responsible position in the Persian Empire. He's, uh, he's descended from these Jewish people. He's been uh, part of that exile, uh, his family. And, and he has a burden for his, for his homeland, a burden for Jerusalem. He, he knows the devastation the Babylonians brought. They broke down the walls around Jerusalem. They burned the gates. They, de they devastated this. They destroyed the temple. Well, somebody came through the throne room who had been there. Now he came, comes across someone who's come from Jerusalem. And he says, so, you know, how are things back, up, back in the motherland? And they said, the walls are broken down. The gates are burned People are poor and struggling that are still there. And, and it just broke his heart. And God started working in him. And he started working with God in a, in a plan. And through it all, Nehemiah, God does some miraculous things in the first chapter of Nehemiah. And he ends up with a lot of resource. And he has a lot of energy. And he's a wise, a wise fella. And Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem. They, they restore what is broken down and what is burned. And it's a miraculous thing how they do it with a great deal of opposition from the people that lived around Jerusalem. Just a powerful story. Well, you do uh, something like that 
And you say, wow, what a great thing God did. Well, God did a great thing. But it's not just brick and mortar, hammers and nails. God, God used those things for a greater purpose. He still uses the hands-on stuff we do for a greater purpose. Because it's not just to, oh, look, now the city's put back together. That's not the end game for God. God wants to grow some people to live in that city who are going to love him and worship him. God's much more concerned about the heart always. And so Ezra comes into this picture. Nehemiah and Ezra, we have books in the Bible, back-to-back name for these guys. They're going to work in partnership. Nehemiah is going to move a lot of the just logistical things. He's the governor appointed by the Persian Empire. He's He's a strong leader, and he's a leader who's a man of prayer and a man who loves the Lord. And then you got Ezra, and Ezra is a priest, a scribe, and he brings Ezra into this thing. He opens the book, and the people began to hear God's word. People are assigned to explain God's word so they understand it, so that they know how to apply it. And for six hours, they listen to God's word. Why would they do that? Why was it that important? Oh, the importance of God's words, the first thing you want to talk about. And uh, you have a program there with some blanks, and we want to fill some of those in for you. Here's the importance of God's word. This is a great verse about God's word from 2 Timothy. You know, Paul tells Timothy, that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which were able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, there, there's something from God's word. It tells you how to know Jesus. All scriptures inspired by God and profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that this book is holy. It means it, it, it presents the character of a holy God and the word of a holy God, the power of a holy God. And it tells us how we can know him. How we can have our sin can be forgiven. How we can walk in relationship to him. How we can know where we'll spend eternity. All those things from this book. And it means that we will be equipped for everything that God intends for us in this world, in this life. And there are all kinds of plans he has for each one of us. And the book is going to point us in those directions. In order to be saved, there's certain things we have to understand. And God's word explains those things. Paul wrote to the Romans, if, we confess, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. He's the king. He's, he's sovereign over me. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Christ, all revealed in the book. It's not a message about a man who will save us, only Jesus the sinless Son of God, God in a body on this earth, can save us. He is the way, and He saves us. The steps are outlined, explained, declared, and, and available for response to all who would believe. The revelation of your words, Psalm 119, which is all about God's Word and about Scripture. The revelation of your words brings light and gives understanding to the inexperienced. The Romans 15 for whatever was written in the past, he's referring to, uh, at that point, the Old Testament scriptures mostly, was written for our instruction so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from the scriptures. And then in Matthew, man must not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus responds to Satan's temptations. He responds and pushes back temptation, the power of the word of God. God's word sustains spiritual life. God's Word shapes our everyday life, and without it, there's no hope, there's no endurance, there's no instructions, no wisdom. We're not equipped for what God wants us to do. Faith falters, and we end up with a lot of foolishness, and ultimately, maybe separated from God forever because we do not know Him. So I want to make this as tangible for us as possible when it comes to God's Word, because remember, we're talking about what it means to be rooted. What are the things that help you to grow the way God wants you to grow? And you cannot do that apart from an engagement, a daily engagement, regular engagement with the Word of God. I think about this book, and some of you follow the persecuted church in the world. People, people are laying down their lives today. You know, in the last hundred years, more people have died for the cause of Christ than in all the rest of Christian history. A lot of people still today giving up their lives. And if they can come away with a Bible, if they have a, 
a, a fragment of this book. It is precious and the, the, uh, the, it is a treasure. We've, it's so available to us. It, they're everywhere all the time. We forget how precious the Bible is in our own country. There have been times in Christian history when the Bible's been taken away from the people and kept, uh, kept away from Hey, we'll let you know what you need to know from this book. You don't need to engage in it yourself. In our times where we have Bibles available, many of them not had my stack of Bibles. That's just a few of the Bibles that I'm going to work out of any given week. A lot of us have multiple, multiple Bibles, but I'm telling you, if you don't open that thing, you might as well be living in a country where you're not allowed to have one. We, we are ignorant of the Word of God, and, and that's true across generations in our country. We have all this access and very little engagement. So how do we engage in the Bible? It's available. How do we take it in? And here's the practical side of this. Uh, several things I want to mention first thing take it in chunks chunks is a good theological word you need to have a good system for reading the Bible you just need to have a plan when it's a plan it's intentional and so if you have a plan you're more likely to read your Bible for me I like to read a little bit from the Old Testament a little bit from the New Testament something from the Psalms something from the Gospels but spread it out so that I'm not just dug in at one spot I know some people think, ah, i got to start in Genesis and i got to read it through to Revelation. But that's not how it's written. And you can do it that way. And I have done it that way multiple times. But uh, I think I've enjoyed the mixing it up a little bit more. You can get a chronological Bible. There are great Bible reading plans out there. Uh, the Bible app, Uver, Uversion, has incredible resources. Uh, some of you, you're going to read it. Some of you are on a long commute. Get somebody else to read it for you. Because all you have to do is push a button and somebody who's a really good Bible reader is going to read the Bible to you. And I'm telling you, I give you a get-out-of-jail-free card. You're still reading the Bible, okay? You get credit for reading through the Bible in a year. And you long-distance commuters, it doesn't take you long to go through all of God's Word in, in a few months when, uh, when it's uh, coming at you in that way. Uh, so just, just do it. Just do it. Just read your Bible. And don't worry about it. I think sometimes we obsess over, oh, I don't understand everything that I'm reading, and so I'm going to quit. Or you hit a list of names. Say, so this, this passage has two different sets of crazy names in it. How many of you believe I nailed all those names? That's three of you. Okay, I appreciate your people of great faith. Uh, and as far as you know, I did. Say it, as I say, when you hit a list of names, we did this back when we did Matthew 1 in December. Uh, when you hit a list of names and you're sharing it, read it with confidence in a well-resonated voice, and whatever you say is going to work for you. So that's all you have to do. But yeah, don't worry about it, because the main thing about those names that are unfamiliar, weird names, is that Ezra is reading the Word of God to these people, and he had, he had leaders spiritual leaders in the land who were shoulder to shoulder with him on that raised platform as he declared it because we need each other when we're going at sharing God's word. So that's, that's the, the picture. Don't bog down the things you don't understand. You run across a place you don't recognize, there, there are things you can do. You know, I have a map in the back of my Bible and often I'll stop when I'm reading and go, where is that? Oh, okay, that's, that's just outside of uh, Jerusalem. Oh, I see. Oh, that's up close to the Sea of Galilee. And it helps you if you're not to, to track with what's taking place in your Bible reading. So there are things you do, but don't, don't fret about that. But I'm telling you, if you, for an average Bible reading, 15 to 30 minutes a day, you read the whole Bible in a year. And it is not a hard thing to do. Uh, and we have multiple plans for Bible reading. Go to, go to the church website. It's still on the front page of the website. And lots of things that are available. You can print them off and you have a paper copy. You can, with you version, you just, you sign on for that thing and it comes to your, they'll text it to you. They'll email it to you every day. And it, it's going to come and find, the Bible's going to come and find you. You can read it with somebody else. Uh, it's so many benefits to uh, doing that. So take advantage. You live in a great time for Bible reading. Take it in chunks. Pray and meditate on it. You know, take a phrase and chew on it. Pray it back to God. You're going to run into things. When I'm reading through my Bible, I'll set a goal. Maybe I'm going to read for the next 30 minutes. Or I'm going to read, and I'm highlighting as I go, because it just helps me to stay on track. It helps to keep my mind focused. 
And, uh, and I highlight differently now. Two years ago, I changed my highlighting method. And so it's an adventure when I'm highlighting. My Bible is a weird conglomeration of marks now. And uh, this, this Bible is uh, not heavily marked, but uh, chunks of Nehemiah and all of 1 Timothy and three-fourths of Isaiah are all marked up now as I'm moving through a new Bible again. But uh, you're going to read, and I've run into this where, okay, I have this big goal, and I hit something, and God starts talking to me about that. When God starts talking to you, your goal goes out the door because God just came up with a different goal. Like he wants me to dig in on something. He wants me to spend some time here. Uh, I was exchanging emails with Wade Gates, and he was talking about uh, Psalm 61. Uh, Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, is the, is the statement. And that's what Wade said. I just had to pull up and think. I'm going to think about that for a while. He's a prayer to the Lord. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I don't know, God, take me somewhere beyond where I've been. And yeah, it's worth meditating on. There's a whole lot there. Last week I talked talk to you. For, for me, Hebrews 12. Uh, fix your eyes on Jesus. And so I have that printed off in big letters. And that's something I, I spend a little bit of time with every morning. It sits right underneath my computer screen. I'm going to see it every day. See it multiple times during the day. To you know, let that marinate a little bit. Think, think ye on these things kind of a verse. The Bible says, Psalm 119, the, the psalmist said, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. It's basically the uh, Hebrews 12 in the Old Testament. So it's not just academic, it's an experience with God. <laughs> Nehemiah, in Nehemiah chapter 1, there's a long prayer that he prays. And in that prayer, he grabs a couple of different statements out of the book of Deuteronomy. And so what he's doing is he's something he's thought about before. He's, he's been meditating on. He prays it back to the Lord at a time of great need. because He's hidden away some of God's word in his heart. And he prays to God who keeps covenants and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Right out of Deuteronomy. So he prays scripture back, meditating on God's word. The advantages of meditation just starts molding you. To have, a, have the mind of Christ. Uh, study it is another good thing. Get a study Bible. I mentioned uh, I have several different study Bibles with just extra resources to cross-reference things. That thing of when you're trying to find, I don't know, there's a, I need a verse about hope. I need a verse that encourages me in prayer. I need, I need a verse. And when you're looking for those things, a study Bible, you can get to those things quickly. But honestly, the other thing you can do is uh, say, Alexa, what's that verse that says hope in the Lord? And you know what? Alexa is a pretty good Bible scholar. Uh, Siri isn't quite as spiritual, but is also a good Bible scholar to help you find those kind of verses. If you can throw out three or four key words in a Bible verse, your search engine, you'd Google, Google's pagan in all kinds of ways, but it can help me find a verse if I know three of the words. So take advantage of what's out there. But it, there are ways to study God's Word. There are Bible software and books and commentaries, word studies, different ways to wrap this up. So take advantage of what is available. Ezra knew it was his job as the priest to make the Bible accessible, to make it applicable. And you want to handle well this this book, the Bible, so that it is accessible to you and you are applying it to your life. Paul wrote, again to Timothy, be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. Sometimes we don't understand the Bible very well and sometimes uh, we don't have a lot of shame in that fact. Uh, you know, we work hard at our hobbies You'll throw yourself into whatever. You, oh, I'm trying to be a better cook, so I'm going to download, watch a bunch of YouTube videos, and I'm going to study, and I'm going to prepare. I, I, my favorite sport, my favorite hobby, my work. I'm going to work. I'm going to push myself in all those things, and we do those things. And yet, we get to the Bible and go, "Well, that's hard." You know, a lot of worthwhile things are. So lean into God's word. Listen to God's word. Study God's word. 
Paul commends the Bereans. It's a people group he ran into in one of his mission trips. He says, they received the word with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were true. He shared the gospel with them. They, they, we gotta, well, let's see if that's really true. And they dug in together and they started studying the Bible, which takes us to the next thing. Seek help from other people. We just do a lot better in Bible stuff than we do it in community. And that's why we encourage everybody in our church to be a part of a Bible fellowship group, a Sunday school class, a small group, whatever you're calling, you're gathering of people here at the church. You need to be a part of a group because there are things that you're going to see that I'm not going to see, things that you may know that I don't know, and we draw from one another. Studying the Bible in community gives it a whole new power and a whole new clarity. So seek help from other people. Now there's one danger, and, and that's the danger uh, when it comes to the Bible, that we will, we will read it and we'll study it but God's word becomes just an academic pursuit. And that's true. That can be if you're the teacher in a class, or that's true if it's just you personally, that I'm an academic expert, and all the vibrancy and life of God's word gets uh, sucked right out, of the, right out of the environment. If we are left untouched by God's word, there are two consequences in the life of a believer. If it becomes just an academic thing, and that's why I, 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 am, not a, I am not a teacher some of you are more gifted in teaching. I am not a teacher. I am a preacher. I believe God's calling on my life is it's always got to mean something for today and tomorrow and the next day. It's always got to apply. So I can go a long time talking about biblical backgrounds and theoretical things in a sermon. And you can walk out of here and say, man, that was a great sermon Chad did a great job giving us the background on all those Babylonian kings and all the stuff they did. My takeaway today is those Babylonians were jerks. What a great sermon. You know what? If it didn't, if it didn't touch your life, if there wasn't a point of application for you, I have failed miserably. That, that's what uh, those Levites that went out into the crowd when Nehemiah gets Ezra up there and shares the word of God. We're going to apply this thing. What does this mean for my life? What am I supposed to do about this? That, that's, that's where we want to come down. So, if we don't do that, we end up being hearers of the word, not doers of the word. We stop doing ministry and we stop sharing the gospel because it all becomes an academic thing. It's all head knowledge. And we are a head knowledge generation when it comes to spiritual things. And that's why we're so anemic in impacting our culture. And it's why we're so anemic in sharing the good news of Jesus with our community and to the ends of the earth. Paul told the Corinthians who were wired that way. Knowledge puffs up but love builds up. If anyone thinks he knows anything. <laughs> he, does, uh, he does not yet know, know it as he ought to know it little humility verse for us. Uh, then seek help from the Holy Spirit. The goal is to know God, not just know about the Bible or about God. It's engagement with God. The Word of God is living and effective. The Word has power. And, and remember, it is breathed by the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And to understand it fully, you're going to need to lean in to the help and the resource of God the Holy Spirit to embrace this word of God. Paul said the, the person without the spirit doesn't receive what comes from God's spirit because it's foolishness to him. He's not able to understand it since it's evaluated spiritually. Uh, I, I prayed that for a long time, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. It's just, just, just a scripture. But when I opened my Bible, I prayed it hundreds and thousands, I guess, of time. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. I want to invite God into my process that uh, it would touch my heart. What are the blessings of God's word? And uh, a lot of blessings. And I was thinking about that. And I came across this blogger, Christian blogger, that just said, and here are, the, here are the things that are really a blessing from spending time in God's Word. If you read the Bible, here's what you get. And just gave a list. And, uh, so I want to amplify on that list a little bit. I thought it was a good, a good way to explain it. The first thing, the blessing of, of, of 
God's word in, the, in our lives? God consciousness is how he says it. And in our process of how we talk about our discipleship process with new believers, with existing believers, and when you're reading the Bible, to ask questions about it. And so you read the Bible, you read a story in the Bible, you read a verse in the Bible, and you ask a question. And you say, what does this say about God? What is this teaching me about God? That's a great place to begin. Because the Bible is the Word of God. It reveals God. And we want to see, what does it say about Him? The first four words of the Bible, in the beginning, God. And there's a whole lot to meditate on just those four little words, in the beginning, God. The Bible tells about the existence of God, the character of God, the plan of God, just splashed across every page of this incredible book, the Bible. And because we're created for Him, by Him, to love Him, to serve Him, designed to walk in close communion with Him, to think, say, and do all that we think, say, and do in reference to Him, there's not going to be a whole lot that's more important than getting to know Him better in the Word. And you find Him on every page. Regular study of the Bible causes everything in your life, my life, to be driven by this God consciousness. Here's what happens. If you're not spending time in God's Word, you can develop God amnesia. And that's where a lot of our... When, and I feel it in me when I realize like my, my fear's going up, my anxiety's going up, my, uh, my discouragement starts going up. I'm probably forgetting who God is. I got a little God amnesia. And I'll go to the Bible, maybe read verses specifically on whichever one of those things I'm feeling... Or maybe just spend some time with God. When I get my focus back on the Lord, a lot gets clarified when I remember who God is. And a lot of things get right-sized when I remember who God is. If you're not digging into Scripture on a regular basis, here's what happens. You say, I believe in God, but you become a functional atheist. And that's not God's will for your life or mine. Second thing. You get the God consciousness. Second thing is you get a self-awareness. And this is in our discipleship pattern. We talk about what does it say about God, whatever you read. What does it say about me? What does it say about people? And, and ask that question because we don't see ourselves as we should. Sin is deceitful. Even as a believer, I have this sin nature warring within me. That's how Paul described it in Romans. And that, that nature warring within me... I, I, sometimes I forget who I am, who forget who I need to be, and I do not see myself as I should. There's spiritual blindness in me. And uh, James talks about it as a, as a mirror. I really intended to keep this up here so I didn't have to walk down the steps second hour. I'm getting, I get my work in, uh, Mr. Porth. Yeah, so this Bible, I bought myself uh, when I was in high school, sophomore in high school, carried it for a long time. And for most of, uh, I don't know, the last 30 years or so, I put something in this Bible. And it's a good reminder something for me. Because when, uh, when I look in this Bible, I see God. I get a God consciousness. But what else I see is I see myself. And I put a little mirror in there just to remind me. I see myself as I really am. Not as I like to think I am. Not as I try to present myself, market myself to the world, but as I really am. And it right-sizes a whole lot about me. And remember, the goal is not just to, not just to know the depth of need for the grace and the help and the encouragement found in the Word of God, but also, always, always, that we would all be meeting the God of the Word. Third thing, benefits, knowledge of God's plan. Jesus captured it in the model prayer with this statement, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what's the principle? The principle is that you and I are created to live for something beyond ourselves, bigger than ourselves. We're created to live for Him, for His glory. God works to rescue us from this this, uh, this claustrophobic, claustrophobic little environment of our kingdom. We build our little kingdoms. We love our little fiefdoms. And 
God has a bigger plan than that. He has his big eternal kingdom that impacts the whole world. And he invites us into this great plan of his. And practically uh, on the seek God's kingdom. Page after page of scripture says this is what it means to live like a kingdom citizen. This is what it means to be one of God's people. This is what it looks like. and This is how the portrait gets shaped up. That God has this plan for you. And it is, it is glorious beyond what you could imagine. And what you could ever instruct, construct with your limited insight into eternal things. Personal transformation. If I were to ask you, this is the next thing. If I were to ask you the question, what is God doing right now in the lives of his children? A simple way to explain that would be change. He wants to change us. He wants to transform us. He wants to make us what we're really created to be. And that is his children reflecting his character, his values, his agenda in the world. So he's working to change us. One of my favorite word pictures of this comes out of Isaiah 55. And it's a poetic uh, part of Isaiah. But uh, he he says, he's he's talking to his people Israel. But he says, I'm going to... I'm going to change you. You're, you're a thorn bush. I'm going to make you a beautiful cypress tree. Okay, so here, think about this. So you take a thorn bush, and in the, in the illustration in Isaiah 55, you, you take a thorn bush and you water a thorn bush. What you expect to get out of that is a bigger thorn bush, right? But when God showers himself into your life, you can have a thorn bush and it becomes this beautiful cypress tree. This is the, uh, I guess, the Old Testament version of if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. All things new. And he can take the thorn bush of me and make something beautiful out of me. And he can do the same for you. That's, that's how God does things in transforming us into his likeness. And it's just the... Uh, Paul talked about the washing of the water with the word. And when the word of God washes over me, I see transforming things taking place in me. Then you get a gospel worldview. Fifth thing, if you're keeping score. Number five. And I don't know if you've thought about this, but you are all theologians. You just may be a terrible theologian. We all see everything through this lens of who God is and what God does and how we relate to Him. But we may not really know God well enough to do that well, to interpret it well and to apply it well in day-to-day life. But we're all making theological decisions every day. And they're decisions about who God is and what's really important to Him. And making decisions about who we are and making decisions about the world around us. And uh, if you're making theological conclusions, which any conclusion about any of those things relationally, that's outside of biblical reasoning, you're going to land in some, some bad places. It's going to affect your life. The Bible is wonderfully helpful because it gives us this from the origins of your life in the world to the destiny of your life and the whole world. And it's all encapsulated in this one book called the Bible. All that was, all that is, all that will be is spelled out. And if we'll spend time in the book, our worldview comes to reflect God's view. Number six, uh, there's, there's two more, but uh, number six may be my favorite just because of how it's said. And then when you read the Bible, it gives you street level guidance. There's hardly a day goes by that I don't need street level guidance. I'm not talking about, you're going to run into those things where, should I take this job? Should I marry this person? Should, should we buy this house? These big will of God, what should I do things? But truthfully, every day we're going to make thousands of little bitty decisions. And those little bitty decisions determine who you are, how you're remembered, what your legacy is, what your life represents are in the the small things of how you respond to people, how you care for people. The Bible says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. All those conversations, all those situations, all those relationships in life, I need street level guidance on how to navigate all that stuff. And God's word is a street level navigating machine. Seventh, commitment to ministry. Just reminds us, 
in God's word again and again that the most important work in the universe is the work of redemption. And from beginning to end, that scarlet thread of redemption that runs from Genesis to the Revelation ties it all together. In, uh, in, in, uh, to the Corinthians, Paul writes, we are, we are reconciled to God by what Christ has done. What was broken is made right. But then we have this ministry given to us of reconciliation that we go into the world to help other people find their connection with God. And we're his, same chapter uh, in 2 Corinthians, our ambassador. We are ambassadors in this world. See, the, more, the Bible does more than just remind us. It defines what ministry looks like. Now, we say here, everybody, everybody needs a mission in the world and a ministry within the body of Christ. Where you use all the spiritual gifts. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about what that ministry looks like and how you apply it and what you do with it uh, in, in this place. The more you study the Word of God, the more you'll come committed and skilled in the practical ministry lifestyle and gospel sharing mission to which we have been called for, which we have been saved. Now, all of this about the Bible comes down to this decision. Why, why would you not want to hear from Almighty God on a daily basis? Why would you shut that down? Why would you slam that, that door closed? When God has so much to say, and it's so glorious, these people, now here's what you get in Nehemiah. They're, Ezra starts reading, and you get two different reactions. They start out, this is awesome, and they all stand up and amen, amen. And then they come in at the end of that passage that I read, and they're all weeping. You know why? Because God's word brought them in touch with your sin's a lot deeper than you think it is. Your, your disobedience to God, your brokenness before Him, and they start grieving. He goes, no, you discover, you discover what God wants you to be, and you lean into that. Oh, that's something to celebrate. And then he says, yeah, it ought to be a celebration that, that God has spoken to you, and you have responded to Him. And that's what we want to happen when we open the Bible. And that's true if it's just me and God, or it's we and God, or... But I want to challenge you, determine today, and you have to set goals, and you have to do things to make it so, to apply what you read to the day. So every day when I read my Bible, there's something in there that's my takeaway for the day, and I have to write that down somewhere. What am I going to do about that? What am I going to do in response? Because God never just says, hey, I got a word for you, and you go, hey, thanks for the good word. There's always something that you apply in that day. So I encourage you, keep a Bible close, visible. The version stuff, it's going to come at you through, social, through, your, through, through your text or email or some means of communication. It'll come find you. Uh, if I keep my Bible on a good visible spot where you almost have to trip over to get past it, that's a good uh, prod for me to be reminded, a cue to be reminded to create that habit. Encourage you to do that kind of thing. Just recognize. God is a God of revelation. He is a God who reveals himself. He is a God by his very nature character. Has chosen to speak to us. And here's the great part. He has a word for you today. And he'll have a word for you tomorrow. Maybe multiple words. But he's always got something to say to you. And why would you not want to hear that? So we're going to be a people of the book.